So today I'd like to talk about building a sequencing revolution, enabling research and policy through diverse tools. It's no secret that sequencing has been absolutely key in this pandemic, but I want to take a moment to really highlight how amazing the sequencing effort in the pandemic has been. We've had unprecedented viral sequencing with over 8.5 million sequences of SARS-CoV-2 available on GISA and millions more available on GenBank and CogUK. But how does this compare to what we've done previously? If we look at previously sequenced viruses, other viruses from SARS-CoV-2, you can see that for HIV, we estimate there's about a million sequences available and for flu about 300,000 and other viral sequences really drop off from here. So this shows just what an unprecedented amount of sequencing has been done in the past two years. And sequencing is absolutely key in getting us to where we are today in the pandemic with multiple effective vaccines, the ability to track the initial spread of SARS-CoV-2 and in countries with more, more detailed uh, sequencing, the ability to investigate outbreaks and transmission. And of course, it's allowed us to understand how the virus is mutating, changing and evolving. And perhaps at the forefront of our minds at the moment, the ability to track and identify variants. And I think Omicron is an excellent example of how sequence availability and our knowledge of the virus has changed the game a little bit on how we're able to identify variants. Previously, we mostly identified variants by looking for the epidemiological changes, such as rises in case counts. We then looked at the mutational changes and the impact of those changes, for example, a, a rise in transmissibility. With Omicron, however, this was first picked up through a combination of genome-wide screening and PCR screening. This meant that we could start evaluating the impact of the mutations in Omicron, for example, the immune evasion, at the same time as we were seeing those first epidemiological changes, the rising cases in South Africa. Now, while all of these things have absolutely been critical and sequencing has absolutely made them possible, these are perhaps the things that we would have predicted in 2019 the things we would have hoped that we could realize with sequencing in a pandemic scenario. But what we might not have envisioned is what that looks like or how we actualize that. So sequences are the raw material and because of that, they are critical. But the pandemic has led to a revolution not only in sequencing, but in how we use those sequences. For example, during the pandemic, we've largely moved beyond publications. They're still very important, but largely that's not what's informing our real-time response. Instead, we rely on real-time analysis, and there's been a revolution in how we analyze sequences and how we're extracting information from them. And this is why enabling analysis is really key, so that countries can use their sequence to inform themselves and the world. But volume can be a real issue here. When we have millions of sequences, just downloading a file or running an analysis every few days can be overwhelming. And this is why developing new tools and resources is critical and sharing and collaboration is essential to make sure these aren't barriers for people trying to do the analyses they need. And in particular, the urgency of the pandemic, the volume of the data, and the speed with which we need the information to inform decisions has highlighted why we need this full range from sequencing to analysis to tools and collaboration. For example, one thing we're really focused on right now is variants, understanding them and tracking them. And many tools out there provide real-time information on how they're spreading, uh, what mutations they carry, and what those variants mean. I'm just showing a few here. And many people around the world, scientists, governments, and public health agencies rely on these tools for real-time updates, as it's not practical for everyone to run these every day individually. But in order to track, identify, and describe variants, whether for tools like these or for local analysis, requires many other things. For example, we need tools to analyze that data. For example, to see the quality control in our sequences and get quick clade or lineage assignments. The ability to put our sequences into larger trees so we can see them in a global context. And of course, the tools to do full-blown phylogenetic analyses to investigate how sequences in our country are related or related to sequences in the broader region or worldwide, or indeed to do outbreak and transmission analyses. But we also need, of course, to know what a variant is. And the Pango framework has been incredibly successful in this. Anyone can publicly link sequences they think might be of concern or of interest for other scientists to discuss and investigate. And this all happens in the open. So we're not depending on just the expertise of one group or one person to be screening all new incoming sequences and looking for things that might be concerning. 
And we're not relying on one person or one group or organization to decide what a variant is or what isn't concerning. This is a group effort where we're pulling on multiple strengths and a collaborative group of scientists around the world. And in that same collaborative spirit, we need ways to build on each other's work. For example, a public tree that might be the background for our own analysis or a list of sites in the SARS-CoV-2 genome that might be unreliable, for example, linked to a primer site and might need to be masked before analysis, or a list of sequences that could be problematic in another way and might need to be excluded. All of these things mean that we don't have to rediscover these individually or repeat the work that others have done. And very importantly, it means we have a choice in the tools that we want to use, in the resources we want to utilize, and the data that we want to incorporate we can be flexible with what we want to use for the analysis that we're doing. And that's really, really important because of course, everyone has different analysis questions and needs. If you give the same data to different scientists, they'll come up with different questions and different ways to answer those questions. Science isn't one size fits all. And that's a real strength. If we can empower people to do the analyses that matter to them, if we can build on the fact that we have many different strengths, some groups or people are more experts at one type of analysis than another. And the fact that we all have different perspectives, we have different backgrounds, come from working on different pathogens, different resources, and different experiences with past epidemics and outbreaks. And if we can combine this so that people can share their analyses and outcomes and share and do surveillance globally so that everyone is able to do it and share their results. And this is particularly important looking forward. At the moment, we're all working on SARS-CoV-2, but we will be turning back to other pathogens. And indeed, many people never left researching the pathogens that they worked on before the pandemic. And in a world of diverse pathogens, we need diverse tools and approaches to enable a number of diverse analyses needed to answer the questions that scientists and researchers think are important. And this is something I feel very strongly about because it's something we're really committed to at NextStream. At NextGen, we provide open source software that allows researchers to do custom phylogenetic analyses. At the start of the pandemic, we set up a specific SARS-CoV-2 workflow that's made pa pa pandemic phylogenetic analyses accessible to a really large community. Though, of course, you can use SARS-CoV-2 for any pathogen. And we provide tutorials and weekly office hours to help people get their analyses up and running. And we're really committed to community interaction and feedback because we want to know that we're providing a tool that is enabling research, enabling analysis. So it's not just saying, here's the tool and how you should use it. And these are the questions you're allowed to answer, but really empowering people to let us know how this tool can be most useful for how they want to use it. And this pipeline has been used by hundreds of indep independent labs worldwide and larger organizations such as the US CDC and more recently Africa CDC. But looking forward, it's clear that we need to empower appropriate surveillance. We need that raw genome data. And even though SARS-CoV-2 has led to more sequencing than ever before for many countries, this hasn't been equal. And there are clearly still countries where sequencing remains a challenge. So the question we have to ask is how can we empower appropriate surveillance, not just for the current pandemic, but also for other endemic diseases that are a problem for a particular country. All countries will benefit from having better sequencing and better analysis. And we will all only be best prepared for whatever pathogen threatens us next if we have a better understanding of all viruses. So as we look forward, it's not just about sequences, but also about how we use them and how we enable others to use them. So we need to be asking questions about how can we empower researchers to analyze their own data, to answer the questions that matter to them in the settings that they're in, with the analyses that are vital to their communities? How do we empower better and diverse tool development and maintenance so that people can not only truly own their sequences, but also truly own and have ownership of the information that is inside of them, the publications that can come from that, and the scientific benefits that will, when it's available, benefit all of us. With that, I'd like to thank you all very much for listening, thank NextStrain for its support in the pandemic, and of course, thank the sequence generators, tool developers, data analysts, and researchers who have made it possible to be where we are today in this pandemic. Thank you very much.